in the year 1993 one day in the month of march i was waiting on god and the lord jesus christ appeared before me and he said today is your birthday i have come to bless you and i totally forgot that it was my birthday that day see when nobody sends you birthday cards how can you remember <laughs> so it has been a, a a custom in my life that every year on my birthday the lord jesus christ comes and will give me a special blessing so that day when he appeared i was so excited as always so i asked him here i am lord here i am lay your blessing hands upon me and bless me so he said instead of laying his hands upon my head and blessing me he said i have come to give you a little gift i said all right lord you know how little kids are very excited of receiving gifts so he put his hand into his pocket and took out a small little box you know when you go to the jewelry shop and you buy a ring it comes in a small little box right it was just about that size and it was beautifully wrapped with a wrapper that was greenish and orangey in color and then there was a beautiful ribbon that was tied on the box which was also greenish and orangey so i received the little box expecting to find guess what what would you expect they are right see i am as smart as you all are so with all eagerness childish eagerness i very quickly unwrap the box and with a childish grin and excitement i opened the box and when i opened the box i was very very disappointed <laughs> because there were there was no any diamond ring or sapphire ring and not even a small little pebble <laughs> instead there was only a piece of paper you would have never have imagined that the um, god of the whole universe would come all the way down <laughs> and to only give you a small piece of paper <laughs> on it on the piece of paper was written isaiah 112 so the lord jesus told me for the last 10 years you have been praying for this today i have come to give you this gift so he said kneel down so i knelt down and he laid his hands upon me and he said today i am filling you with the spirit of the lord with the spirit of wisdom and revelation with the spirit of counsel and might with the spirit of the knowledge and the fear of the lord from today onwards all the seven spirits of the lord will manifest in your life and you will begin to flow not just only in the nine gifts of the holy spirit but in the fullness of the seven spirits of the lord and when he took his hand and he just looked at me i looked at the lord jesus and i asked him lord i have never ever heard any body ever preaching or teaching on the seven spirits of the lord so how does these spirits manifest how do they work how can i learn to flow in the seven spirits of the lord if i do not have any understanding about them i must have some understanding so that i can flow in all the seven spirits of the lord so that i will know when that anointing is manifesting i would know this is the manifestation of the seven spirits of the lord and i could cooperate with the holy spirit and flow along the current instead of against the current and the lord jesus christ like a loving father he just smiled at me with a very sweet smile you know the lord jesus christ has a very very sweet and beautiful smile 
one smile from the face of the Lord Jesus Christ will convey 1,000 words about his great love. So he said, all right, now I will teach you. So for the next one and a half hours, he sat down and taught me all about the workings of the seven spirits of the Lord, how the spirit manifests, how they work, what are the definitions of these seven spirits of the Lord. And after that, he said, now, learn to flow in it. So this revelation was given to me in March of 1993. And in all these years, this will be the second time that I'm teaching on this revelation. The first time that I ever taught this was in October of 94 in Perth, Australia. This is the first time in the US. And I, maybe this will be the last time. So you saints will be the blessed people to hear this teaching. Turn your Bibles with me to Isaiah chapter 11 and the verse 1 and 2. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. If you count them one by one, You'll, count, you'll find seven spirits of the Lord, but they flow in four rivers. Seven spirits of the Lord, seven manifestations of the seven spirits of the Lord, but they flow in pairs, thereby becoming four rivers. Tonight, we are going to meditate and study about the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Now, if you look at the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, there it says the first gift is the word of wisdom. Now, what is the difference between the word of wisdom and the spirit of wisdom? The word of wisdom is just a small fragmentary word from the larger wisdom of God. The word word in the Greek is logos, a small word. God is the source of all wisdom, all understanding, all knowledge. So from his wisdom, a small tiny weeny word comes to us. But the spirit of wisdom is a river, not just a word. It is a river that contains a stronger larger bandwidth it's not uh, when you log on to the internet they have a small dial-up connection and broadband connection right are you familiar with these terms so the word of wisdom is dial-up connection <laughs> and the spirit of the Lord is the broadband connection so there is a greater revelation of Understanding that flows abundantly in the spirit of the Lord than the word of wisdom. Now let us look at the spirit of wisdom. What does the spirit of wisdom mean? Now this is the definition. I'm sorry I don't have any notes to put up on the overhead projector. But I will read to you slowly so that if you're writing them, you can write, you can take down. If you are very slow in writing, thank God for technology. <laughs> we have audio tapes, video tapes, DVDs, what have you. <laughs> the spirit of wisdom is the supernatural ability of God that comes upon our spirits to see Jesus as he is and to get a spiritual understanding and knowledge of the word of God. It enables us to know what to do, when to do, 
and how to do in every given situation. It enables us to maximize our use of God-given talents to its fullest potential in order to effect his plans and purposes. It will also reveal the manifold, unsearchable wisdom and secrets of God and the things in heaven. Amen. Amen. <laughs> to put in a nutshell, <laughs> you know, what I've done is like what scientists does. Have you seen a cockroach? You have. The cockroach that we call cockroach, the scientists don't call them cockroach. They have a very long, unpronounceable Latin name. But a cockroach is a cockroach. <laughs> right? So likewise, this is a long Latin-like definition. But let me give you a simple layman definition. The spirit of wisdom is simply an unfolding comprehending of the wisdom of God. That's simple, isn't it? Why complicate matters? Now let's go for another complication now. <laughs> the spirit of understanding. If you read Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17, there the apostle gives us a different definition of the spirit of understanding as it is written in Isaiah 11 2, there in Ephesians 1 17, he says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So revelation and understanding are both the same. So what does that mean? Spirit of revelation. It is the comprehension imparted into our spirits from the Holy Spirit and transmitted into our minds. It doesn't pass from the head to the heart, but comes from the heart to the head. It is the voice of God speaking to our spirits and informing to our mind of that which God is going to do. It is the unfolding of hidden secrets to us by the Holy Spirit a revealing of mysteries and clear insight into the future. Now the simple layman language. The spirit of wisdom or the spirit of understanding and revelation is simply an unveiling and comprehending the wisdom of God. See, the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation you need both to work together for us to not only understand but to apply the knowledge. It is one thing to know and the other thing to understand. So spirit of wisdom, the word wisdom in the Greek is Sophia. And Sophia is the insight into the true nature of things. What else? Understanding gives you the ability to translate into a working relationship of the wisdom that you have received. Is it simple enough to understand? Or is it Greek to you all? Is it very simple? See, one is the spirit of wisdom enables you to comprehend. See, in the spirit realm, in one split second, you can comprehend or the wisdom is imparted into your spirit in one split second but it doesn't register in our human mind you need the spirit of revelation to unravel unzip it comes zipped up and you need a stuff it expander <laughs> so the spirit of revelation is like a unzipping not only it unzips, but also enables us to apply the wisdom that has been comprehended in the spiritual realm. Thereby, you will have not only a theory, 
but also a working knowledge of the things of God. Now, how does this spirit operate? It operates in three areas. Firstly, it gives us a knowledge of the Godhead. The Godhead has always been a mystery to everybody. Amen? Amen. As much as you try to understand, the more you understand, the more you will realize that you don't understand. <laughs> this is the mystery, no? Every time you think that you have gone, you have gone up one step higher, the reality is you, are, you have just gone one step lower down. Yes. One step lower down and of unknowing. You undo what tradition has taught you. You undo what man-made theological tradition have taught you. For example, let me give you one small little example about man-made theological tradition. You may have seen pictures of little baby angels with cherubic wings and flying around everywhere. Have you? Right. Now, where in the world they got such an understanding, I do not know. All angels in heaven do not have wings. Some do, some don't. For example, the archangel Gabriel, he doesn't have wings. Michael, he doesn't have wings. So where did we get the idea that they all have wings? Because in our finite mind, we cannot comprehend anyone flying in the universe without wings. <laughs> so we give them wings. <laughs> you see how silly we are? Angels appear and they disappear within the split of thoughts. They don't need to fly through the universe with a pair of wings like Superman. <laughs> they don't need any cape to help them to guide along the universe. They appear and they disappear like a shaft of light in, the, in a shaft of fire. And they suddenly appear and they suddenly disappear. That's how they travel. So, some angels have six wings, some have four wings, some have different, different kinds of appearances. See, this is some of our man-made theological traditions that have taught us wrongly. So the more you take a step forward to knowing God, you are actually going one step backwards to undo what you have actually learned. Every step you take to get closer to the Lord Jesus, you are only coming to know that you do not know about Him. We think that we know. This is our biggest problem. The charismatic church thinks she knows. But she is so foolish in not knowing that she doesn't know. She thinks she knows. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ looked at the Laodicean church and told her, You are poor. You are miserable. You are wretched. You think you are rich. You think you know all. You think you are well off. But you are the most miserable of all. This is the word not only to the Laodicean church, but today's charismatic church. So the spirit of wisdom and revelation enables us to know the Godhead. Under the knowledge of the Godhead, what can we know? Firstly, the meaning of the acts of God. If you read Matthew chapter 11 verse 25 and Luke chapter 10 verse 21, the Lord Jesus Christ rejoices and tells and prays to the Father in heaven that God 
has opened the comprehension of the Israelites or his disciples that they have begun to know the deep things of God. He has revealed to them the works of God, the ways of God that they have begun to understand. A revelation was given unto them. If you read Daniel chapter 2 verse 22, there the prophet Daniel says that the seasons and the times of God, the ways of God, the timings of God have been made known. Now we need this wonderful spirit of wisdom and revelation because he will enable you to understand God's purposes, God's timing for every nation. At this point of time in history, what is God wanting to do in a given person's life, in a given nation, in a given continent? You know, our life on this earth is not just a mere existence. If you think your life is by accident, you are wrong. No one is born in this world by accident. No one is born because an unwanted pregnancy was not able to be destroyed. There are no accidents, only purposes. The spirit of wisdom and revelation will give you the understanding to know the purpose of, of God for your life, for your church, for your nation. At this season of time, what God wants to do? At this phase of your life, what does God wants to do? When you understand that, and then you step to the next phase, then your life will be fruitful. It will not be a wilderness where you walk aimlessly, for 40 years like the Israelites don't have to if only they had obeyed and understood the purposes of God they would have crossed from Egypt to Israel in one day the journey from Israel, Egypt to Canaan land was only a day's journey not 40 years but because of their disobedience because of the dullness of their understanding the Lord God took them on a merry-go-round roller coaster. That is where today's theme parks get their ideas of roller coasters from. <laughs> from the book of Exodus. It was one big long roller coaster because the entire journey took 40 years. You don't want to get into that roller coaster, do you? No, we want to walk with God, but the journey is only one day. Secondly, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in unfolding and revealing the knowledge of the Godhead reveals to us the secret of Christ's divinity. If you read Matthew chapter 16 verse 17, the Lord Jesus Christ looked at all the disciples and asked them, Who do you say I am? So every one of them threw their lucky guesses, like as if they were playing the Wheel of Fortune game. <laughs> and some said he is Elijah, some said he is uh, John the Baptist come alive, some said he is Jeremiah, and everyone were missing the target. So the Lord Jesus asked them, fastening his eyes upon Peter, he said, but who do you say I am? And Peter looked at the Lord Jesus and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The moment the Lord Jesus heard that, he was thrilled. He said, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven had given you this revelation. See, unless revelations come from above, we cannot know, we cannot understand, we cannot even comprehend. The spirit of wisdom and revelation is the one that enables us to comprehend, to understand. If you read Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, it says Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead that dwelleth bodily. What does that mean? The fullness of the Godhead that was dwelling bodily in Him and Christ in you. 
is the hope of glory. What is that? What is Christ in you, the hope of glory? What hope of glory is, is it talking about? The spirit of wisdom and revelation is the one that brings you to have a deep, intimate knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you like to see the Lord Jesus? Then you need this gift. Once you are filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, seeing the Lord Jesus Christ will be like seeing your next door neighbor. The veil that has been separating will no more exist. Sometime in the year 1983, in the month of November, I was fasting and praying for the many, many needs that people had written to me for prayer. So I had that day I had about 300 letters that people had written to me for prayer. So I told my staffs, no one should disturb me when I'm praying. Till today, no one would dare to knock on my door when I'm praying. No phones, no emails, no none of the technology that exists today. You know the technology can be either divine or devil. Right? If you ever want to learn to walk with God, the number one thing that you must get rid of is your watch. This, you know why? Because you always start looking at your watch. You give yourself some time to pray, five minutes. And if God doesn't come and talk to you within five minutes, you stand up and say, Goodbye, Lord Jesus. This is the first thing you must put in the microwave oven. <laughs> so I knelt down to pray and I just closed my eyes and I said, Dear Holy Spirit, help me now to pray for all these needs. Suddenly, I heard somebody was opening the door and I grew a little upset. Say, when I have given clear instructions that no one should disturb me, how is it that suddenly they have found some guts? <laughs> Not even my own mother will dare to knock on the door when I am in my prayer closet because they all know that I am never to be disturbed when in communion with the Lord. Nothing else can be greater than your time with the Lord. Amen. Amen. This is what charismatic Christianity must learn. Yeah. Not to be bounded by programs. Yeah. By time, by this and by that, that tries to steal our attention. So when the door was open, I was about to say, how dare you, when I saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing there. <laughs> he was as real as how you see me standing before you right now, wearing a beautiful royal blue robe. Not unlike the traditional white robe that we all imagine. That is another one of the traditions wearing a beautiful royal blue robe, he was standing at the door and I just looked at him, froze in mid-air because I was about to say, how dare you? <laughs> so, and he opened the door, looked at me, closed the door from the back. Now, all these are real. They are not visions or imaginary. He literally, tangibly opened a real door and then closed the door from the behind came and walked towards me and he looked at me and he said, I have come to pray with you. Now that was the second shock that I got. I've never ever heard anybody ever preaching, Jesus Christ will come to pray with you. You only read in the word in Hebrews 7.25 and Romans 8.34 that Jesus Christ ever leaves to make intercessions for us. Have you read the scripture? Right before my eyes, I saw this scripture coming alive and enacted before my eyes. 
before I could say anything, what greatly astounded me more than anything else during this visitation till today is the great God of the whole universe, he knelt down. This is something we never do in our charismatic Christianity. We lie down and pray. We sit arrogantly on our chairs and we pray. We even bring pillows to the church to lie down and pray. And then we claim that we are having intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. You know, you will fall asleep if, with your pillow with you and your comforter there with you. Where do we get all this kind of foolish understanding? Why we do that? Because we do not know who God is. He's not your next door neighbor. Someone you can just go up, put your arms around and say, Hi Jesus. Do you know he's full of light? That you cannot even stand beside him. Full of light, full of glory. In Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 10 you read, When the angel Gabriel appeared to him, He fell down. Because he could not stand before the presence of an angel. If a mortal man cannot stand before an ordinary angel, how much more the creator of the whole universe? If he comes and stands in you, stands before you, how can there remain any strength? There would not. Why we have a very callous understanding about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is because the charismatic Christianity has been taught wrongly about the Lord Jesus. This is the reason why we have no reverence for God. You come to church as if you are going to a beach. You are dressed like that. You know, if you read in the, in the Old Testament in Exodus, when God gave the order for the making of the tabernacle, He very explicitly gave instruction to Moses how the priests should be dressed. If it wasn't important, why did God give so much great details for? Of course, I do believe He's a God of grace, but He's not a God of indecency. Sometimes in today's charismatic church, we do not know whether it is a Las Vegas club or a real church or it is a beach in Miami. You come, dre you come to church dressed like that. In Isaiah chapter 6, if you read, you'll find that when the seraphim appeared before Isaiah the prophet, six wings. With two wings, they covered their face. With two wings, they covered their body. And with two wings, they covered their feet. When they appeared before the presence of the Almighty God, there was a total covering that appears reverence. You know, God, let me tell you with all love and honesty. Do you want it as it is? Yes. God never withholds His glory from His people. The church must learn how to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Yes. Today's charismatic church knows nothing about worship. The, all the worship that we know, that we claim that we know, is only singing and dancing. Where if you jump up and down like a kangaroo, <laughs> that is not called dancing in the spirit. That's only jumping up and down in the flesh. And we proudly claim that we are dancing before the Lord in the spirit like David danced. How, tell me the truth please, how do you know how David danced? Has any one of you lived to see King David dancing and singing before God? No. But we claim that we are singing like David danced, sing and dance like he danced. My dear brothers and sisters, the church, the charismatic church that lives today, is very shallow in her understanding of worshipping God. This is the reason why we are not seeing the glory of God in our churches. 
Where is the Shekinah glory? Jesus Christ, the head of the church, should manifest in our means if we worship him unto whom we are coming to. Right? Am I correct? Yes. So where is he? Why isn't he manifesting? Why aren't our spiritual eyes been opened to see him? We are simply fooling ourselves in the church. Deceiving ourselves that we are worshipping the Lord when we are just simply singing songs to make you feel good. We are not really worshipping God. If you truly worship God in spirit and in truth, in the beauty of holiness, I guarantee you today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ will always be present in your church and the Shekinah glory of God will come down, literally come down in your midst. I guarantee you because this is what the Lord Jesus said. But you know, we are just simply fooling God, fooling ourselves and deceiving ourselves into thinking we are worshipping God in spirit and truth. That's not it. The church, charismatic church must learn what it really means to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Stop singing songs that make you feel good. That's what most of the songs, psalmists, so-called psalmists today are writing songs about. Songs that make you feel good. Not make you feel good. It must bring you down to your face to worship the Almighty God. When you prostrate yourselves to worship the Almighty God, then all the sevenfold blessings of God will come down upon you. That is the reason why all the angels in heaven are continuously praising God. If you study the book of Revelation very carefully, what, this is what the Lord Jesus revealed to me in two visitations I had which I wrote a book called The Art of Worship. How the church should really worship Him. And when they worship, the sevenfold blessings of God that comes upon the angels will also come upon the church and the believers. Not one blessing, sevenfold blessings of God. So when the Lord Jesus Christ came and knelt down, He said, lay your hands on all these letters. So I laid my hands and then he took his hand and laid upon my hand and he said, now let us pray. So if somebody say, let us pray, what are you supposed to do? Bow your head and close your eyes, isn't it? Now what I did was, I closed my eyes, but just open one eye. <laughs> just open one eye and tilted my head towards my right to see how the Lord Jesus prayed. See, this is the, my first experience. I don't want to miss it. See, there, there were no video cameras that I could catch the entire action on a camera. Oh, I didn't have even my camera to catch the oh, visitation. So, when the Lord Jesus said, let us pray, he lifted up his head heavenwards. And he began to sigh and groan. Romans 8.26 says, the Holy Spirit groans. Have you read that? Right before my eyes, I was seeing that scripture becoming alive. Tears were flowing like rivers. They flowed and flowed. You know, no words were coming out of his mouth, but he was just sighing from the very bottom of his innermost being. His whole body was revolting, jolting, and he was just groaning and sighing and tears flowed and flowed and flowed like waters. If you read Hebrews chapter 5 verse 7, there it says, Jesus Christ prays with great crying and great tears. And when we, and all that is not collectively for all the 300 letters. Just for the first letter. Just for the first letter. You know, today you have preachers in the West 
will, have, will dump all your requests into one big box. And then they'll pray one collective two-minute prayer. For all the offerings that you send them, you get a two-minute prayer. But not the Lord Jesus. One by one, we went through all the 300 letters. Every time he finished one prayer, he would tell me, now, this is the word for that person. Write an answer to that person like that. One by one by one. Several hours passed by when we finished all the 300 letters. Then he stood up, he laid his hands on my head, and he blessed me, and he disappeared. From that day onwards, my spiritual eyes were permanently open. Whenever I pray, I always see the Lord Jesus Christ standing before me. When I'm praying for people, he will tell me what is the, what is the problem they have in their lives, or even when they write to me. When I'm reading their letters, the spirit of wisdom and revelation will enable me to see into their lives. Wherever they are, thousands of miles away, see into their homes, what is the problem they are going through, and then to pray effectively and efficiently for them. And then always the Lord Jesus Christ. Say in a meeting like this, when I'm praying, you will walk down in the aisle among the people, and you'll go and stand beside one person, and you'll look up at me and say, now this is what I'm going to tell you about them, tell it to them now. Whatever brokenness is in your heart, he never ever fails to bind every broken heart. Amen? He's a good God. And every step you take to walk closer with God gives you one revelation, one understanding about Him. How many of you have prayed, Lord, touch me? Only one person? Oh. Lord, please touch me. Have you ever prayed like that? Today I tell you, please stop praying like that. You know why? This is one prayer. God is getting sick and tired of hearing from you. <laughs> you know why? Because he has already touched you. Now he wants you to touch him. James chapter 4 verse 8 says, Draw nigh unto God, and he will draw nigh unto you. The scripture does not say, God will draw nigh unto you, and draw you unto himself. It doesn't say like that. He says, you, first take the first step. You come closer to him, and then he will come closer to you. So, but we are praying, Lord, you touch us. What else he is saying, you touch me. <laughs> this is where we are missing everything. I tell you one more time. God does not withhold any of his riches, any of his grace, any of his glory from none of his children. It is we who have withhold ourselves from eating the children's bread. Why are you satisfied with the crumbs that fall on the, at the master's table? This is what we pray. Lord, just give me the crumbs. Why are we praying that foolish prayer when you can sit on the table with the master and eat a loaf of bread with your father in heaven?
praying you. But what are you praying? Lord, give me your crumbs. You know, crumbs are for dogs. Are you a dog? No. If you are a child of God, then you don't need the crumb. You need the loaf of bread. In order for you to eat the loaf of bread, you must learn to climb up and sit on the chair. And I show you another better way. Don't just be subtle with the chair. Sit on the table. <laughs> you know, I have six, uh, four nephews and two nieces. When they are growing up, small little ones, they always look very cherubic like. Children always look very cherubic when they are small. And uh, once in a while, when they come to visit me, I had one favorite nephew. So this boy, when he comes into my room, when I'm busy write, doing my work, writing books or answering some mails, he will just come up to me and call me, uh, touch by patting on the chair, and then I will look at him, he will just lift up his hands, meaning carry me. So I just lift him up, and sit him on the table. I said, all right, what do you want, David? I'll ask him. So he will then tell me all things that happened to him in his school. And he'll give me a big story. No matter how busy I am, when he comes with such a tender love, I'll put aside all my busyness and make him not sit on my laps. Sometimes I do, but when I love a little bit too much, if not three much, <laughs> put him up on the table, see eyeball to eyeball straight. If you're sitting on the lap, you are, God is looking down, but if sitting on the table, you look eye to eye, and after he tells me all his story, I will hug him and give him one big little kiss and then put him down and said all right now run so once he gets that little love that satisfy him abundantly so he'll run away see this is the secret we must learn god is not putting any barriers before you we are putting barriers between us and god so thirdly the mystery and the purpose of, of God will also be made known to us through this spirit. Romans chapter 6, uh, sorry, Romans chapter 16, verse 25. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9 to 10. And chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. The mysteries of God. See, in the Apostle Paul's life, he was abundantly filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation that enabled him to comprehend the mysteries of God, the mystery concerning God's will, the mystery concerning the salvation of the Gentiles, that the Jews and the Gentiles are not two people, but one people. That mystery was revealed to him. Now, only the spirit of God will enable us to understand, will give us the insight into mysteries and secrets whatever secrets that God has kept hidden in him will be made known to us through the manifestation of the spirit of wisdom and revelation several years ago I was praying one morning just having my devotion with the Lord when the spirit of the Lord told me to pray for a certain minister's wife I didn't know what uh, she was going through, so I began to pray in the spirit for her. As I was praying in the spirit, I felt my spirit was taken out of my body and translated into the mind of God. Have you seen a picture of the human brain? You have not? Please tune in to Discovery Channel. So just like the human brain with all its various tunnels and lines drawn here and there, I was in the mind of God. 
it looked like a giant brain at that moment I didn't know I was in the mind of God I thought it was somewhere somewhere I was in some place so I was standing straight up but, and I could feel my skin touching you know the brain is a very grayish tissueish fleshy substance right so when you touch it you'll feel very what you, what's the word to use Funny. say again Funny. slimy no no not that not that bad spongy ah, that would be a better spongy we don't want to use slimy for God so very spongy and I stood there and the next moment I was traveling at very high speed faster than the speed of light in the mind of God zooming through in zigzag manner and every time as we were as I was moving in the mind of God every now and then my hand or any part of my body would just touch and brush against some tissue some part of God's mind and every time I touch some place a revelation concerning the pastor's wife was given to me and the revelation I got was she was pregnant at that time three months or five months pregnant at that time and the revelation was given to me she will give birth to a male child and the child shall be called Samuel this is how he will grow up this is how his future will be from one year old to two years old up to five years old up to ten years old up to twenty years old his entire future how it will be it was all revealed to me as I passed through the mind of God you know the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4 before God formed us we existed in the mind of God that day that scripture became very real to me see it is this spirit that enables us to understand the secrets the mysteries and the purposes of God for our life for the future for concerning nations if you read first Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 and Colossians chapter 2 verse 2 the Apostle Paul always says that all things that he had learned it was not through man's wisdom he was taught by visions and by revelations even the serving of the communion he was not present when the Lord Jesus broke bread but it says if you read first Corinthians chapter 11 very carefully verse by verse it says now this was how I was shown when I meditated he was taken in the spirit translated back into the time when the Lord Jesus was breaking bread and he was standing there and witnessed the whole scene how the Lord Jesus broke bread and when he saw that event not only he saw the bread and the wine but the comprehension was also given to him what the bread means what the wine means and what it does to you in the spirit in your inner man when you partake it worthily that was how he was able to write in great depth the mysteries of God the secrets of God secondly the spirit of wisdom and revelation will open the eyes of your understanding and enlighten it what does that really means it means your spiritual eyes will be flooded with light wisdom understanding means enlightenment it brightens up your eyes to see God you see when Paul had an encounter on the road to Damascus with the Lord Jesus Christ his spiritual eyes were open to see the Lord Jesus Christ if you read Galatians chapter 1 verse 16 it says like that and if you read Luke chapter 24 verse 31 on the road to Emmaus two disciples were walking and talking about the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus joined them 
but they did not know it was the Lord Jesus. And they were all walking together for several miles and the Lord Jesus opened the eyes of the understanding to understand the scriptures. And when they came, when he came to his, their house, the Bible says, when he broke bread, their eyes were open. When their eyes were open, they saw the Lord Jesus Christ. Today, if you want to see the Lord Jesus Christ, your spiritual eyes must be open. Even if you see with the eyes of your flesh, it is not your eyes of the flesh that sees him, but it is your spiritual eyes that are located directly behind these natural eyes. This is how I, have, I was taught and I have seen it. They are directly behind your natural eyes. And the spirit, it is the spirit eyes that sees true. In this one manifestation, the natural realm becomes one with the spiritual realm. When it becomes one with the spiritual realm, the invisible world is no more invisible. It becomes natural world. Let me give you one example. The Bible says, where two or three are gathered, the Lord Jesus Christ is in our midst. Everybody agrees? Yes. There are more than three of us here right now. Do you all believe the Lord Jesus is in our midst? Yes. Everybody agrees? Yes. If he is here, where is he? Can any one of you point a, a certain geographical place and say, this is where he is standing? We can't because we can't see. But the scripture says he is in our midst. If he is in our midst, why can't we see? Because it is in the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm, unfortunately, because of sin, has now a veil over it. Though it exists, coexists together, the spiritual and the natural. Am I going, am I confusing you all? No. Is it very simple? Yes. Good. The spiritual realm and the natural realm coexist together in one. Unless and until the veil of our flesh is removed, we will not be able to see them existing together. But once the veil is removed, we will all be able to see the Lord Jesus standing in our midst. Not only the Lord Jesus, but hundreds of angels also standing in our midst. Not just hundreds of angels, but also some heavenly beings. Yeah. They all are here. But our eyes have been beholden. We need the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Do you need it? Yes. Only that spirit can enable us to see. When the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ comes to us, the spirit of wisdom will also bring us into another deeper relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, many times we all desire to have a deeper intimate relationship with the Lord Jesus. Have you? Yes. But as much as you try, Many times we are failing and we feel so guilty that we are not trying hard enough. Now let me tell you, unless God helps us, we cannot be drawn into the inner secrets of God. You take the first step of drawing, then he will draw you into himself. If you read John chapter 14, verse 21, it says, it actually gives you a shortcut to seeing the Lord Jesus Christ. You like shortcuts? Yes. We all love shortcuts, don't we? That is why we have drive through McDonald's. <laughs> shortcut, you know, you don't have to go and queue inside the restaurant. You just drive through order your stuff and drive away. John 14, 21 says, If anyone meditates the word of God and practices the word of God, Jesus Christ will manifest himself to that person. You don't have to fast and pray. This is the good news. 
all you have to do is meditate God's word day and night. Not just reading something deeper, meditating. And don't stop there. Practice the words. Practice what the word says. When you keep on doing it, day after day, day after day, day after day, one fine day, as you are meditating the word, you will hear a voice behind your ear saying, do you understand what you are reading? And as you are about to say yes or no, and you turn around and look, your lover of your souls will be standing right beside you. And then he will come and sit beside you, and he say, let me explain to you what this scripture means. This is my experience every day. Not only the Lord Jesus Christ, even the angels will come and teach me what the word means. I have never gone to any Bible school to study, to be trained into the ministry. I would love to, but I had no money at that time. Today I have little money, but I have no time. <laughs> So when I had no money and all the time, I just bent my knees, fasted and prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to teach me everything. So he decided to help this poor little dumb son of his and come and teach all things. My dear brothers and sisters, John 14, 23 says, once you keep on meditating God's word, day and night, day and night, and then your spiritual eyes are open to see Him, then comes the other glorious step. Like I told you, sitting on the chair is different from sitting on the table. Now He will draw you into sitting on the table experience. That is Jesus Christ coming to make His abode inside you. Now that is a very, very wonderful, real, tangible, out of this world, out of this realm experience. I was praying for that for many, many years. Lord, come and make your boat in me. Make me worthy that I may be entitled for your abode to come inside me. You know, once you keep on praying umpteen times, you forgot when you first started. One day, I was in the mountains in Tibet, doing the work of the Lord among the Tibetan people. One morning, I knelt down to pray and wait on God for what He would speak to me to do in Tibet that day. And the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to me. He was standing about six feet away from me and he said I have come to answer your prayer today I said what prayer Lord which prayer he said the prayer that you have been praying for 10 years that I should come and make my abode in you I say yes Lord today I have come to answer that prayer saying that from a distance of six feet he started walking when he walked, he walked right deep inside me. When he walked right deep inside me, I felt for the first time in my life what the scripture says, that Jesus Christ is the fullness of God bodily. I felt that I was filled with Christ from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, totally saturated with the fullness of Christ. From that day onwards, when people come to me for prayer, when I close my eyes and I looked at them, I will see the eyes of Christ opened. And I will see through the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ into the hearts of the people. And then he, now it is no more he telling me, this is what is your problem. I can just see and know, comprehend and understand what are the needs. And when I go to a church, when I walk in and just stand there, and the eyes opens, and I just see truth.
through the eyes of the Lord Jesus the spiritual condition of the church the spiritual condition of the people how spiritual they are or how high how low sometimes you all claim that we are too high only to be revealed to know that we are just too low this is a marvelous experience only the Holy Spirit through the spirit of wisdom and revelation can draw us into that experience they are all there for the church for every believers thoughts that are before hidden will no more be hidden Luke chapter 2 verse 35 tells us like that thoughts that are hidden will be revealed and made manifest secondly the spirit of wisdom when the eyes of your understanding are enlightened it will reveal the father God to us the father God always remains a mystery to all of us we, we have you ever desired to see the father God how many almost all I have a bad news for you the bad news is nobody can see the father God I'm sorry are you disappointed I'm sorry about that but because do you all love me only a few people <laughs> do you love me yes. because you love me I will reveal a secret to you a good news how you can see the Father God technically it is impossible but I reveal a secret to you can you keep secrets no, no. then I better not tell you <laughs> the secret is the spirit of wisdom and revelation will enable us to see the Father God it is absolutely possible absolutely possible Matthew 11 27 says whomsoever the Lord Jesus wills and desires to him he will reveal the Father technically it is impossible see when Moses prayed that prayer show me your glory God said nobody can see me and leave even if you read John chapter 1 verses 14 to 18 you will read there John saying nobody has seen God which is true because first Timothy chapter 6 verse 15 and 16 says God dwells in unapproachable light the very words unapproachable means you cannot approach unto if you cannot approach unto how can you see but you can see if Jesus Christ is the express image of the invisible God then the fullness of the understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ would be a revelation of the Father God right now the day that this revelation dawned on me I began to pray a different prayer I said Lord Jesus you said in your word that you will reveal the Father to us so now show me the Father so again I began to pray for a long long time one day I was teaching uh, this uh, a group of uh, Bible study in a Bible study class on the prayer secrets in the tabernacle so I came to the last session that was the Ark of the Covenant which symbolizes waiting on God so before pray, before teaching I said let us all stand up for a word of prayer and I started praying as I was praying I was caught up in the spirit into heaven and I saw the Lord Jesus Christ he had blood in his hand and he looked at me and he said come and I walked behind him and he appeared before what looked like the ark of the covenant in heaven if you read Revelation chapter 15 there the Apostle John sees the ark of the covenant in heaven whatever Moses made on this earth were a representation of the things that are in heaven everybody agrees you're with me so far 
Are you believing every word? Yes. Any problem? No. no? All right. And as we approach before the Ark of the Covenant, above the mercy seat, there was a huge, terrible looking cloud that was so awesome and terrible in its holiness that I feared to look at it. So I stood behind the Lord Jesus. If ever any lightning or thunders would come from the cloud, I am protected. <laughs> so I stood behind the Lord Jesus and he looked at me and he said, come and stand beside me. So I came and stood beside him and he had, I didn't know that my prayer was going to be answered that morning. I didn't know. It was just another ordinary visitation. That was all. <laughs> so he, he had the blood in his hand and he placed it before the mercy seat. He just lifted his hand, placed his hand above the mercy seat that was, and his hands were under the cloud. And when he did that, he said, now look, when I looked on the blood of Jesus Christ, the face of the Father of God was reflected. When it was reflected, I saw in a split little moment, the face of the Father God. And then he quickly withdrew his hand. He said, that's all. Anything more, it will kill you. <laughs> now you can go back. So when I opened my eyes, my mouth was still praying the opening prayer before the Bible study. It is possible. If the Lord Jesus Christ wills, and to whom will he will? To his friends. Those are his friends. You know, remember one thing. Jesus Christ never satisfies mere curiosities. The large percentage of charismatic Christians, they like to see God. Why they like? Because they like. Just curious like. And I promise you today, if it is just curiosity, which always kills the cats, <laughs> It will never, never impress God. Start, stop being curious. Start desiring. Amen? Thirdly, the revelation of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is always a very mysterious person. We know Jesus Christ was manifested in the flesh. We read the Bible, how he was, we can read about the Father God. But concerning the Holy Spirit, we have only very flimsy idea about him because he is spirit. And the Hebrew word and the Greek word for the spirit means wind, breath. If it is wind, how can we see a wind? We can just feel the wind moving in one direction to another direction, but we can't see the wind. But I tell you a truth today. When you are filled with the spirit of wisdom and revelation, He will enable you to see the Holy Spirit. To see the Holy Spirit meaning not see Him as who He is because you can't see the wind, but the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We read in the Word the different, different kinds of manifestation that He takes. And this spirit of wisdom and revelation will enable you to talk with the Holy Spirit, to hear the Holy Spirit, to understand the mind of the Holy Spirit, to even understand the thoughts of the Holy Spirit, and to see the various manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, I was writing this book called Into His Holiness, which is available at the book table. And I came across a chapter. I was going to write about tongues. So when I came across the chapter, I wrote the preface and I got stuck, not able to go any beyond that. But in my spirit, I knew there was something more. 
So I prayed. I said, look, Holy Spirit, unless you teach me, I cannot write this book. I cannot make this revelation known to the body of Christ unless you teach me. I know there is something much more deeper. Please teach me. And I just waited for 45 minutes. See, if you ask God something, you must wait. If you don't wait, how are you going to receive? This is our problem in, in charismatic Christianity. We don't wait. We are always rushing, trying to drive through. So as I was waiting, I felt someone standing beside me. When I opened my eyes, there at six foot high was a river of life, like a waterfall that appeared and stood before me. And I didn't know what it was. And then the water spoke to me, a voice from the water spoke. And then I knew John 7, 38 to 39 says, the Holy Spirit will flow like rivers of living waters. That day I saw this huge wall of rivers of living waters standing before me and the Holy Spirit spoke. This is the secret concerning tongues. And in one split second, just one split second, from Genesis to Revelation, he expounded to my mind the mystery of tongues as it is written from Genesis to Revelation. And then he disappeared. In what I comprehended in one split second took me one entire week to put into writing what he revealed to me in one split second. See, in one split second I comprehended through the spirit of wisdom what it meant but it took the spirit of understanding to bring this understanding to my little dumb brain one entire week to put it into writing see sometimes or many times spiritual things have no earthly comparisons so I have to look for all the right words so that a truth is never miscommunicated you know when a truth is miscommunicated wrong teachings are given birth to we don't want to do that do we so this is the marvelous operation of the spirit of wisdom and revelation thirdly firstly is the knowledge of the godhead secondly the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened thirdly the spirit of wisdom and revelation will enable you to know the riches of the glory of god what are the riches of the glory of God? They are the glorious inheritance that has been reserved by God for the saints. It is the rich treasury that God has in heaven for you all, for us. They are all there waiting for us to just partake them. What are the riches of His glory? In John chapter 14, verses 1 to 3, the Lord Jesus said, In my Father's house, there are many mansions. Amen? Amen. So how many heavens are there? We all know there are three heavens. Everybody agrees? Yes. yes. And the first heaven is the starry sky. The second heaven is the universe. And the third heaven is the heaven itself. Everybody agrees? Yes. This, is a, this is where we all are wrong. As always. We are always wrong with our traditional theology. Heaven itself, there are three heavens. Heaven itself, there are three heavens. So far, three heavens have been revealed to us. But I tell you, in my father's house there are many mansions many doesn't mean three it means many how many many <laughs> right many mansions with an puller s so why when the bible is silent on something 
why are we defining something of the spirit realm when the Bible is silent? Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 29 says, The secret things of God belongs to Him alone. They don't belong to us. What has been revealed is for us. That which is not revealed, they belong to God. So when the Bible is silent, we should be silent. We cannot say, maybe it means like this. Maybe it means like that. No. There are many, many, many wonderful things in heaven. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 4, the Apostle Paul describes about his experience in heaven. First he says, I was taken to paradise. Then he says, I was taken to the third heaven. Both are not the same. They are two different places in heaven. Paradise is a different place. Third heaven is a different place. And there is a fourth heaven, there is a fifth heaven, there is a seventh heaven, many heavens. The place where the Lord Jesus Christ abodes is different. The place where the heavenly father abodes is different. There are different, different, different places in heaven. Different homes for the angels. Paradise is usually a place, a big, huge park. The word paradise in Greek means a park, a garden, beautiful garden. When I first was taken there to heaven, in, I was amazed when I was standing there and watching. See, I was a visitor. So I had my vis visitors passed. <laughs> in heaven, the method of instruction is not teaching. It is impartation. Impartation. And every teaching model appears three-dimensional in heaven. They are not one-dimensional di like on piece of paper. They are three-dimensional. And after the lesson was over, all the children were running around playing, and the angel looked at me and said, Your lesson is finished today. Now you can go back. So that was my first experience when I was taken to paradise then I understood what Paul meant when he wrote he was in paradise paradise is a different place third heaven is a different place you see the heaven is full of the riches of God's glory if you read Revelation chapter 15 there is a temple in heaven that is in a different part of heaven a temple is there where there are angels that goes in and out in the temple and they have priestly duties in the temple they do their priestly ministries in the temple and they are elders in heaven you read in the Bible 24 elders have you read them? 12 from the Old Testament patriarchs and 12 from the New Testament apostles agreed? Amen, Amen. where do we get the teaching from? Whoever told you that the 24 elders represented 12 patriarchs from the Old Testament and 12 apostles from the New Testament? Where do you get that teaching from? Now, if that is correct, let me prove you wrong today. 12 apostles would include John. Agreed? But he was standing there and looking at the 24 elders. How is that possible? So he was saying double? <laughs> I tell you, the 24 elders are not 12 patriarchs or 12 apostles. They are a heavenly beings. Heavenly beings created by God for that particular role. They are like the living creatures that were guarding the throne of God. The 24 elders. I would really like with all my heart to go a little deeper and explain to you about these elders in heaven but some many deep things of God cannot be freely thought. The larger body of Christ is not ready 
to understand or receive these things. But this is the truth. They are all different. So many of the deep things of God can only be comprehended by the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Amen? Amen. And Isaiah 45 verse 3 tells us that the hidden riches, the hidden secrets of the richest places will be revealed to us through the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Deep secrets, whatever it may be, none is hidden anymore. Several years ago, I was waiting on God for three days. And on the third day, as I was worshipping the Lord, an angel of God appeared before me. And this angel was very glorious, very bright, and he was appearing before me in the spirit, but the brightness was so bright, I had to close my eyes. And he stood before me, his, his garment was glistening like lightning, and he had a thick golden belt around his waist. And he had a plate struck in his hand, and he stretched the plate towards me, and he said, these are the fruits from the tree of wisdom. God has sent them for you, take and eat. And I looked into the plate, there were three kinds of fruits. They look like a watermelon, cut in a quarter, and a big black currant, three, three pieces, and another fruit that looked like a pear, also cut in a quarter. Why they are cut in a quarter? They all have a spiritual symbolic meaning. And he said, take it. Now up to that time, I've never ever heard a tree of wisdom, have you? We only have heard the tree of life. So I didn't know whether this angel is a true angel of God or not. So the Bible says, test every spirit. You wouldn't know when Lucifer himself is coming like an angel of light. So I prayed. I told the angel, you just wait a minute. Let me double check. <laughs> I prayed, Spirit of God, is this truly an angel sent from heaven by you? Or is the devil impersonating himself like an angel? And the Holy Spirit said, I had sent him to take the fruit. So I took the fruit and I ate them. They were very, very sweet. Very, very sweet. So after I finished eating all the fruits, and the angel just disintegrated into small, tiny, weeny particles. Have you seen Star Trek movies? <laughs> when the captain say, beam me up, Scotty. <laughs> How they all disintegrate all the molecules. That day, I saw the angel from head and the toe, they all disintegrate into the center and it disappeared. I just couldn't believe what I was seeing with my eyes, but it was real. Anyway, after he left, the Lord Jesus appeared before me. And he came and stood, sat on my bed, and he said, Now, I am going to teach you some mysteries of the universe. So he began to open my mind. See, from small, I was always very fascinated by astronomy. I almost wanted to become an astronaut. I wanted to go and join NASA to become an astronaut. Who knows, I may have been gone with the Columbia shuttle. Anyway, so when the Lord Jesus appeared before me, he began to unravel the mysteries of the universe that has been puzzling the scientists. You know, Einstein's theory of relativity. Have you heard of that? the most famous E equal MC square equation. The Lord Jesus explained to me what that equation meant and how it is true but wrong. It's true but it only applies in the spiritual realm. It cannot be applied in the natural realm. So Einstein received by inspiration an equation of spiritual realities. See, Einstein, in his book, The Theory of Relativity, explained 
four dimensions in, in space. The length, the breadth, and the height as we know it is. And he propagated another, the Z. Z called the space-time. Now that Z, he says, if we ever break out into two times the speed of light, we can travel back and forth into time. The Lord Jesus said that is very true but wrong. Wrong because it is not possible in bodily form. It is impossible in bodily form. Because the body, human body will break up to zillion pieces and cannot come back together like they move, show it in the movies. <laughs> it is impossible. Technology will never find a way of doing that. It is impossible because sin still rules in this body. Yeah. 